This interview was originally conducted by English author Nikki Peacock, and all of these questions appeared on her blog. Greetings. I am novelist and author Eric Mus Barnes, and I am visiting with the lovely Nikki Peacock to talk about my prodigious vampire duology, The Vampire Noctuaries, beginning with The Gothic Rainbow and concluding with Anun's Maelstrom Festival. Now, I refuse to make the tell-us-about-yourself predictable joke regarding long walks on the beach, but, you know, I am a big flirt, so I would certainly take Ms. Peacock on a moonlit graveyard stroll. Now, although I live in Los Angeles, I was born and raised in Ohio, birthplace of Nine Inch Nails and most Twilight Zone episodes. Thus, my homeland imbued enough spooky and rage in my blood to pen a respectable vampire tale. Okay. Um, let me try this. I, I tend to ramble a lot, so let me attempt to keep this succinct. Okay. Uh, from the ages of 14 to 21, I wrote a few awful short stories and approximately three unfinished novels. And sometime in 1993, I decided I'm not Ray Bradbury. Maybe I should outline a book first. And that worked. I finished The Gothic Rainbow in 1996. Never tried to get an agent or publisher because you know, it was a labor of love and for better or worse, there was no way I would allow anyone to edit or change it. I always knew I'd self-publish. Side note, I have a profanity-laced blog post regaling my disgust for self-published authors who know nothing about spell check or formatting, so fear not, I've never been one of those writers. Now, this was back in the days before on-demand printing, so by 1997, I was $6,000 in debt with a thousand copies of my novel staring at me from my grandparents' basement. Now, in 2011, I wrote a short and snide human resources book, Schooling Your Boss to Not Suck. In 2013, I published four new books, including a reissue of The Gothic Rainbow and the sequel, Anun's Maelstrom Festival. All five of my books are available as ebooks, paperbacks, or hardcovers. I've also been published in a couple anthologies, uh, one for skateboarding and another on gothic artwork. I'm still sitting on about 200 copies of the original Gothic Rainbow 2, now fuming in a closet instead of the basement. The childlike empress bade me. When the golden-eyed commander of wishes bids you a task, you see it done. When I was 14 years old and read The NeverEnding Story for the first time, corny as it sounds, that was the catalyst, the turning point. Seeing the movie truly changed my life. And later, reading the Michael End novel only reinforced my convictions. There are many saviors of Fantastica, but sometimes you know when a story is more than a story. Sometimes, the influence of an imaginary character is far more compelling than the advice of real people. Let me start by re-emphasizing the first book in the Vampire Noctuaries duology was published 16 years ago, and I started writing the series 20 years ago. In other words, I've given this sort of question a lot of thought. These days, I think every vampire story gets compared to Twilight. And my story was published eight years before Twilight ever hit the shelves. So I want to make that clear, because I never want folks to presume I am jumping on the bandwagon of vampire stories. On the contrary, I was one of the sinister 
faceless coachman guiding the way. You would never heard of me, but I was whipping the nightmares into submission before anyone ever thought of sparkly daywalkers. Now, the vampire noctuaries doesn't follow the trends because it was begun before any trends existed. As to what I find fascinating about vampires, honestly, I really dislike vampire stories. And that's why I wrote one, so I could finally read a tale I enjoyed. The vampire noctuaries stem from the idea of fallen angels, dark fairies, and vampires all being the same creature with different names. I felt there was so much potential with these beings blessed with great power, but cursed to live in darkness. Now, how did they cope with the decay of their humanity? What if they embrace it and celebrate it instead of getting all self-loathing and morrissey about it? You know, I wanted to explore those ideas in a way that didn't involve werewolves or vampire hunters or seeking the origins of vampirism or love triangles or vampires facing off with the oldest vampires or all those other cliches of trendy vampire tales. This story is kind of like, well, think The Catcher in the Rye if Holden Caulfield was an angry vampire instead of an angsty teenager. I'm reading the colors in your radiant eyes and the delectable curve of your lips, Ms. Peacock. Sorry, I told you I was a flirt. <clears throat> um, I was lucky enough to procure one of the final brand new copies of the 2005 printing of The Essential Ellison, a 50-year retrospective by Harlan Ellison, direct from the publisher Morpheus International for a sum only slightly above the cover price. The book is out of print and therefore very hard to find and expensive as hell to buy from retailers. It's one of those wonderful phone book sized 1200 page compendiums. You know the type, it makes the Codex Gigas look like a leaflet. I'm only reading one or two stories every other night or so just to savor it as long as possible. I have my eye on a few Ray Bradbury volumes of similar girth, books of you know such heft they could double as trebuchet ammunition when the orcs begin their siege. Originality is my greatest inspiration. I love authors who experiment, play, try new things, do all the stuff you're not supposed to do in writing. Yeah, you know, sometimes it's a disaster, but sometimes it's marvelously interesting. You know, Paul Giamatti once gave me a copy. Sorry, did I just become a name-dropping Hollywood tool bag? Uh, he gave me a copy of A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. And that's a prime example of that type of writing. You know, first-time author at 40, total mess of a book breaks all sorts of writing conventions, yet it works. It's a wonderfully fun read and bizarre as a carnival freak. As to concrete names, I would cite Ray Bradbury and Harlan Ellison as the gentlemen I admire most as writers. I would have to sprinkle in some J.D. Salinger, Richard Bach, and uh, Francis Hodson Burnett too. I have not read enough of Henry Rollins, but I really dig his stuff as well. So, I mean, as you can see, my tastes are kind of all over the place, you know. Hardcore punk rock star, dreamy metaphysical goop, classic masters of fantasy and science fiction, popular literary dude, enchanting children's author from 130 years ago. So it's a rather eclectic mix, but they are each brilliant in their own ways. You know, my initial thought was the business side of things. Now, most authors love the act of writing, but hate the whole marketing, promoting, pimping, whoring part. But in thinking about it, I realized there is something worse. The part I loathe most 
is never being taken seriously. And when I say I'm a graphic artist at a gaming company in Hollywood, or I build websites for Disney, or I design toys for the company that invented Care Bears, people are impressed. And when I say I'm a novelist, people frown and think, yeah, he's unemployed. You know, tell folks you're a musician or an author and they look at you with scorn unless you can back it up with, you know, in the London Philharmonic or my name is Stephen King. I mean, let's face it, you could earn six figures a year as a novelist and 99% of the population will still have no idea who you are. I, heck, you could earn seven figures and no one will know you. I think that's the most irritating part. Regardless of how much recognition you lack or gain as an author, no one ever regards you seriously unless your books are turned into blockbuster movies. Oh, a writer? How nice. You know, sounds like, oh, you have leprosy? How quaint. The parts that write themselves in a book you know, I, I always feel like Merlin in those moments. You know that part in Excalibur when Arthur kneels to be knighted, something that Merlin has not foreseen, and Merlin looks all excited? You know, poor Merlin constantly looks irritated and bored with life because he's been cursed with the gift of foresight. He knows everything that will happen, so nothing is a pleasant surprise for him. And that's how it feels as an author. You become Merlin. You have the gift of foresight. You know what is going to happen in your story. You know where the characters are going. You know the plot twists. But sometimes there's that unexpected little sidetrack. You know, some event diverges off from the main path and you're left there, a stunned Merlin, watching the events you didn't foretell unfold before your eyes for the first time. I love that. And I also love my fans. I know that's a terrible banality, but it's true. As a writer, you create this stuff alone in your room with no idea that anyone will like it, so when people voice some appreciation, it's always a welcome pleasure. It's good to know you had a positive influence on the world. I have a new fiction novel I'm striving to finish by December 2013. I won't give away any details, but I will say it's nothing like my vampire books. You know, emulating the writers I admire, my dream has always been to leave a diverse array of stories upon this earth in a wide variety of genres. So all I'll say at this point is fiction and no vampires. In the meantime, I'm striving to get my name out there again. You know, being away from promoting my work for 15 years, I have a lot of catching up to do. You know, it's odd to be a veteran and a promising young author both at the same time. So thank you very much, Nikki, for the chance to appear on your site and tell people a little about ye old one Peter novels. I have my own website at ericmusbarnes.com, a blog at inkshard.com. My books are at Lulu and CreateSpace and Amazon and Smashwords. You know, I'm, I'm basically, I'm easier to find on the internet than, you know, cat videos and dirty pictures. Just search for me, you'll find me. Thank you very much for watching this interview episode and be sure to subscribe and like the video, and we will see you next time.